Autumn day, gangway. The day's late light fills a village lane. With whom can I share my cares? Nobody takes the ancient road. Millet sways in autumn wind. So we continue with a new poets in our expansion of the 300 Tang Poets anthology. Uh, so let's start with an introduction on the figure of Geng Wei. Now Geng Wei is a late 8th century poet. He passed the Jinshi examinations in 763 and probably died around 787. And he was one of a group that we've encountered quite a lot in the 300 Tang Poems anthology, the Dali Shi Zai Zhu, the, the Ten Talents of the Dali Era. If you remember, or if I remember what I said about them when we saw their poems, the, the one that first comes to mind is Lu Lun, who I think is also the best represented in the said anthology. The Dali Era poets were manieristic writers generally, quite good craftsmen writing just after the heyday of the high tang, imitating and perfecting, polishing uh, the high tang poetic style, especially in its descriptive and naturalistic uh, formats. But uh, the, the critical appraisal, I think, in, in China from ver very early on was that you know, their poetry is formally and, you know, uh, polished and, uh, you know, it, it really matches the style. But there's this feeling that it tends to be mm, superficial, right? lacking in depth, lacking in, in feeling and in social political uh, commentary. It's just ornate and a good imitator and continuator of the great style. Now, from this point of view, Geng Wei repre would represent uh, mm, a little bit of a step forward in a different direction, as it is commonly agreed that he was the least ornate writer of the group. As we said, he passed the Jinshi in 763, then he held a series of minor positions, um, mid-level, not, not completely minor, but mid, lower mid-level positions in the bureaucracy, like reminder of the left, acting editor of the palace library, um, administrator for law enforcement, yeah, but not the highest posts, some provincial posts as well, so not the, the highest positions in the, in the hierarchy. Uh, his poetry, uh, I'm following here, uh, Nien Hauser in his Biographical Dictionary of Tang Dynasty Literati, his poetry tends to concentrate on personal themes but often lacks detachment. Make him less of a nature poet than one of his colleagues in this group, uh, Sikong Shu. And he also wrote many heptasyllabic verses with realistic descriptive passages mm, reflecting the social disturbances of the latter half of the 8th century. Katnian Hauser, in, in his book, presents as, 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 as a representative poem, Lupang Lauren, The Old Man by the Roadside, which reads pretty much like one of those new ballads, those Xin Fu. Uh, that was so liked by uh, Juan Shen and, uh, and uh, by Zhu Ji. You know, it's a poem in which an old man uh, who doesn't have any children, you know, is just talking about how his life is, you know, a lot of toil and suffering and how he sees no perspective, no positive perspective towards the future. And uh, this, this depiction of, of, of socially complicated situations and desolate landscapes is pretty typical among his 170 extant poems. Nevertheless, the poem I've chosen is one that is included in the Poems from the Masters anthology and uh, that was translated by uh, Red Pine. Uh, it's a shorter poem, it's a quatrain, as, you have, you've, as you, you've just heard, but, and I've chosen it because I think it represents very well uh, the, the different layers of readership and of, 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 of meaning that are included in Chinese poetry in general, but, but, but in classical Chinese poetry, but not only in classical Chinese poetry, you know, in, in all good poetry, you could say. So, so there's two ways of, uh, at least two ways of reading this poem, Autumn Day. One of them is, you know, just a literist reading, and from that point of view, it's just a depiction of a, a slightly melancholy autumn scene. It's uh, the end of the day, we're in a rural setting. It's autumn, we know it from the title. There's a road probably in front of the lodging of the poetic persona, which is an old one. 
and there is a field of millet nearby that is swaying in the autumn wind. So, you know, from, from on the face of it, it looks like a pretty straightforward, uh, natural, descriptive poem. Uh, but, but we must remember that in a lot, if, if, if not in all of classical Chinese poetry, nature is always seen as correlated to um, human emotion, human feelings. There is this uh, correlation, this parallelistic thinking in that nature should or man should resonate with nature. And uh, there are some cycles in nature. Autumn is the time of the year of, of melancholy, of sadness. The fact that the poet is choosing autumn as a topic already connotes that he is probably attuned to autumn sadness, autumn melancholy. So I was saying there are different ways of reading this poem. Uh, uh, like, and, and, and you know, poetry, when viewed as an aesthetic exercise, um, I would say literature in general, is, is not obsessively focused or shouldn't be obsessively focused on transmitting uh, meaning, but rather on creating an aesthetic effect. And this can be done in different ways. Um, for example, ambiguity and different layers of interpretation are part of that. Well, that, that, that would at least be the thesis of, of new criticism and of, of many literary critics of the, of the first half of the 20th century. And so, so having different layers of interpretation and therefore allowing the reader the ability to explore those layers or even to appropriate through the ambiguity of the original text and its, its possible references to other texts, allowing the reader to, to reconstruct and, and make the text his or her own, something that is highly valued in literature. But anyway, I'm going around in circles. Let's focus on this poem. So, as, as I said, the, 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 the face reading is, okay, this is a poem about autumn, okay? If, if we look more closely, you know, things become a little bit more complicated. Why is there a millet, a field of millet, swaying in the autumn wind? Uh, so, so, you know, this could be an innocent image and a realistic one, but... Swaying millet is connected to a poem from the Book of Odes, the classic of, of the Confucian tradition, which was memorized, which was learned by heart by all uh, candidates to scholar officialdom. And the poem, it's one of the odes of the Royal de Mesne, uh, The Millet Sways, and it's also a poem that on the face of it, it's just depicting somebody who is sad and walking through millet fields and, you know, brooding in his own thoughts. But the traditional commentarial um, interpretation of that poem, which you know, would have been as well known as the poem by Geng Wei and his contemporaries, uh, the Mao Commentary, interprets this poem as a lament at the fall of the Western capital of, of the Zhou dynasty. Uh, at the beginning of the 8th century, uh, barbarians invaded and sacked and destroyed Hao, Feng, Feng and Hao, which were the capitals of the Western Zhou dynasty. Uh, the dynasty survived, but it had to move its capital to the east. And that period, Eastern Zhou, is a period of um, political decline for the, for the Zhou dynasty, and generally perceived by the classical Chinese as a period of decadence. So any reference in a Chinese poem to swaying millet, in a classical poem at least, always evokes not only that classical text, but also the interpretation of that classical text seeing the ruins of an ancient city, seeing the fall of an ancient dynasty with all the sad and melancholy mm, that, that pertain to it. So, so uh, we, we will enter into more detail when we comment uh, the, the, the second couplet of this poem. It only has two, but, but you know, that reference <laughs> to millet swaying in the autumn wind is not just a descriptive element, probably. You know, it's, uh, it, it locates us, probably uh, the poem is being composed when the poet is close to or living in Chang'an. So Chang'an, the Tang imperial capital, was pretty close to where the old Zhou uh, capital, Western capitals had been. So he's geographically close to the alleged place in which uh, the Swaying Millet poem was composed. And, you know, like almost all historical references, probably, you know, this is admonitory. Geng Wei lived through the Anlushan Rebellion and the chaos. Uh, that, that followed, which included the sacking of Chang'an, not only by the rebels, but a few years later by the Tibetans. So he is living in that sort of situation and he is making that sort of reading. We are now in the equivalent of the Eastern Zhou dynasty, probably. Our, our dynasty has survived, but barely. And uh, you know, it's good to think about the examples of the past. 
and, and of course, that, that, that was that reference, but there are other references, but, but I think it's better if we see them carpet by carpet. But ancient road, you know, again, is it an ancient road or is it the ancient road in Chinese, is Dao? And it's, it's literally a road, but it's also used for the way, with capital W, that is um, the right philosophical or ethical um, doctrines that have to be followed. So the ancient road can also be read as the ancient doctrines, the ancient models. Okay, so uh, let's, as usual, go uh, take a look at the poem couplet by couplet. It's just two couplets that won't take us long. So first the title, Autumn Day. Remember, autumn immediately brings to a, a reader of classical Chinese poetry associations of melancholy, sadness, decay. Mm, it's not still winter, so, so there's still some element of beauty, but mm, it's surrounded by ominous uh, elements. And it's always the bittersweet melancholy season that is always the elegant and appropriate mood for most of classical Chinese poetry. So we know from the title of the poem that presumably the poet is going to be attuned to this autumn sadness or is going to play with those expectations at the very least. First couplet. The day's late light fills a village lane. With whom can I share my cares? So, so the poem begins very visually with, you know, this late light. So it's sunset. Not only do we have autumn, we have the second reinforcer of sad and melancholy mood. It's the end of the day. The sun is setting. And again, this is literal, but this is also metaphorical. Sun is setting perhaps on the poetic persona's life and expectations. Sun is setting on the empire. And, you know, this light... Although you could imagine, again, with different layers of interpretation, that the poem really is also inspired by, you know, the poetic persona of the poet, just looking out and uh, and seeing this lovely uh, end of daylight. I like this image very much. Uh, probably that's one of the reasons, along with the multiple interpretations, why I chose this uh, poem by Gang Wei, uh, because um, the fading light of day you know, it's a very strong image. For example, Gongora, uh, well, one of my favorite poets, has it in the Soledades, pisando la dudosa luz del día, like treading on the dubious uh, light, on the dubious, dubious, um, because it scares and disappearing, the dubious light of day. Uh, returning light is, is the name used in Chinese, fan chao. Uh, so, so the sun is setting, the light is filling a village lane. The village lane is also important because um, we've got the setting, autumn, we've got the time of day, late day, and now we've got the location. Uh, we're probably close to the ancient capital, but we're not in it. We are probably in the outskirts. Uh, village lanes appear in a lot of poems, notably by um, uh, the, 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 the immediate example that comes to mind is Tao uh, Zhuang Ming, Tao Qian. And, you know, a scholar official's voice and persona in a village lane, generally the notes that one is retired or at the very least one has been exiled, one is no longer part of the bureaucracy, whether willingly or unwillingly, and you know, one is living in retirement. So, so, so maybe the poet is in his old age, uh, or he is no longer being employed, or, or maybe he has been sacked, but anyway, there's this mm, detached from the world perspective of the poet in a hidden village lane far away from the hustle and bustle of the court, seeing the sunset. Again, his own lifetime sunset, the day sunset, the empire sunset, all in one. With whom can I share my cares? Uh, so, so, so this already connects us with the swaying millet poem, even before the image of the millet swaying in the autumn wind, because the poem has lines um, like those, I think. Those who know me, no cares fill my heart. Those who don't wonder what I have lost. Because in the original poem that is being referenced, um, Drooping Millet, um, the poet, you know, that, that's a refrain. And, and the, the poet is doing just that. He is pacing around, and, and he mentions that. Those who know him, you know, are aware that he is sad. Those who don't think, why is he... Hanging with, looking, walking around with his head hanging low, looking at the ground. Has he lost something? So, so, so this with whom can I share my cares? 
clearly connects with, with that original poem and, and introduces that mood. The poet is sad and brooding. Why is he sad and brooding? Uh, perhaps he is sad and brooding because of his own problems and, and, and frustrations, but probably he is also brooding because of the bad state in which the empire is. Uh, yeah, next couplet. Nobody takes the ancient road. Millet sways in autumn wind. So nobody takes the ancient road. We're in a village lane. Nobody takes this old road to come here and visit. And there are just fields, agricultural fields swaying, a visual image. But again, different readings. The millet swaying in the autumn wind clearly connotes drooping millet. And, and, and remember, this poem was was allegedly, it's, we could discuss, probably experts would discuss if, if the original poem really referred to what the interpreters in the hand later thought, but no, it doesn't matter anyway, because for, for a Tang poet, the interpretation, the commentary would have been <laughs> the legit interpretation of the original poem. So, so, so as I said, the interpretation says that this was a poem Drooping Millet composed when Hao was destroyed by nomads as a result of the um, corruption, bad stewardship of King Zhou, uh, 781, 771 BC. So the lessons of history seem not to have been learned, is what, what this couplet seems to be evoking. Nobody takes the ancient road, n nobody comes here, but also nobody uh, follows the Tao. Yeah? Uh, the road, the way, the correct way of rulership. And, and because the correct road is not followed, the monarch, the, the implicitly uh, the, the ruler from before the An Lushan rebellion, uh, Xuan Song, in his later years, was accused of you know having wasted time with parties and beautiful women, especially uh, the favored concubine Yang Guifei. So the idea is, because we're following the bad models of the past instead of the good, because we're not following the royal way, the ethical path of good rulership uh, of the king, uh, striving in for, for, for doing his best and choosing the best uh, civil servants and completely oblivious to self-satisfaction and self-pleasure, that ancient road is not followed. And therefore, <laughs> drooping millet comes around to the destruction of the capital and chaos and suffering for all of uh, society. So, uh, the ancient road again could be interpreted literally like the, the ancient road that leads from this maybe village in the outskirts to the capital no longer exists or is no longer being um, walked. Finally, the last image, yeah. millet sways in autumn wind. Yeah, it's a visually uh, seductive image, you, know, you can just imagine fields of millet swaying in the wind, it's a nice image, but again, it has all these overtones of, of we are repeating <laughs> drooping millet, because the times have circled around to that same sort of situation. So, poem of criticism, but also it has this, you know, it has this descriptive naturalistic element, but it has also this exhortatory, if you wish, or admonitory subtext of, well, you know, we should change our ways. So, an interesting take by uh, Gang Wei. <laughs>